Episode 81. Why not? Yes, Mr. Bennett. Aaron's face lit up as he shouted. He wanted to ask Kevin if he could beat up Godin after he was done, but the words were trapped in his throat. No, we can't let him sit here. Before Godin could say anything, Chelsea's pretty face turned cold. She was the first to speak. Wasn't it intentional for the smelly older adult to sit opposite her? Kevin frowned and said coldly, Is this your seat? Miss Starr choked. Of course, this wasn't her seat. However, she immediately glared back at Kevin and said, But it wasn't yours either. Why did you get your friend to give up the seat to him? Why don't you give up your seat to him? Selfish. Aaron's face turned cold. He wanted to say that he liked standing, but Kevin waved his hand and said, Why do you need to explain to her? Aaron, ask this gentleman to come over and sit down. Yes, sir. Aaron nodded. No, no problem, son. I'm fine just standing there. The kind men's help naturally moved him, but it was also clear that Miss Starr and Miss Urich were too pretentious to be seen around men like him. He did not want the men to get into another argument because of him. Sir, really, it's fine. Come over and sit. I'll stand. Aaron frowned. I'll repeat it. Don't let him sit here. Chelsea panicked, seeing that Aaron was going to help the foul-smelling man. She stood in front of him and blocked his path. That's right. Do you want to fucking pretend to be a good person? What right do you have to implicate me? Godin also chimed in on the side. If you say one more word, do you believe I'll throw you out? Kevin looked coldly at Godin and said. Facing Kevin's cold gaze, Mr. Urich couldn't help but shiver. However, he still said firmly, You dare. You can try and see if I dare. Kevin sneered. Godin opened his mouth and wanted to say a few more stubborn words, but when he saw Aaron eager to give it a try, he fell silent. He found that the two men were not ordinary people. This time, Chelsea was not stubborn and unruly, letting Aaron walk past her without a second thought. Although she hadn't experienced the baptism of society, she wasn't stupid. She knew that Aaron and Kevin were, after all, two grown men. If they clashed, a weak girl like her wouldn't be able to fight against them. However, she would teach Kevin a hard lesson when she got off the car. Aaron pushed the older adult onto a chair, but his expression was fear. He couldn't sit straight up and didn't even dare to raise his head. Sir, why are you going to Los Angeles? Kevin asked as he glanced at the black cloth bag the old farmer was hugging tightly. My son is sick. I'm headed there to give him the money for his medical fees. Seeing Kevin look at his black cloth bag, the old farmer was immediately on guard. He tightened his grip around his cloth bag, but his tone was still very cautious. Kevin smiled and didn't take the man's cautious eyes to the heart. As soon as the older adult got in the car, he could tell that the man's bag probably contained around $50,000. It wasn't much compared to Kevin's wealth, but it was his life's saving for the older adult. Kevin's heart sank when he heard Godin bullying the older adult, and he wanted to show him some respect, so he gave him a seat. Kevin also noticed a few shady-looking men eyeing the man's bag in the corner, so he wanted to protect him. Even though the man held his bag tightly and was very cautious, Kevin could tell that the crooks were much more skilled. After all, thieves rely on stealing technology to feed themselves. If the older adult were standing in the middle of the crowd, the money in his bag would become a pile of paper in less than 10 minutes. He was afraid that he would discover that his money was gone once he arrived at the hospital. Making the older adult sit beside him could be considered protecting him. Kevin did not believe that there was still a thief who could steal from under his nose. When the train was about to arrive, the brakes squealed to a stop. At this moment, Godin's phone rang. Mr. Eric, our brothers have already arrived at the train station and are waiting for the two little brats to get off. A harsh voice sounded from the other end of the phone. Tell the boys to wait. The train is about to arrive. Godin glanced at Kevin and Aaron proudly and said with a smile, Did you hear that? My people are already here. You too. It's not too late to get on your knees and beg for forgiveness, he said arrogantly as his nostrils flared. Kevin and Aaron didn't even look at him. However, 
The old man looked at Godin anxiously and begged, Sir, these kids, they didn't mean anything by this. Just let them go. You old piece of shit. Shut up. Do you think I will let you off later? With the two men ignoring him, Godin became even angrier and could only vent his anger on the old man. Sir, don't be afraid. After we get out of the car, who will be there to make me get on my knees? Kevin consoled them lazily. Some people wanted to die, so he couldn't stop them. You are scared to death, yet you are still bragging here? Chelsea rolled her eyes in disdain. She felt that Kevin was still acting tough. Since Godin knew the contractor, they were all workers at the construction site. They were all excellent fighters when it came to fighting. Kevin and Aaron were as thin as monkeys, and a kick would probably kill them. Kevin ignored Chelsea. She didn't bring herself to be bored. She took out her cell phone and made a call. Mommy, I'm here. Where are you? Not too bad. I just met a few disgusting men in the car. Love you, Mommy. Mwah. Los Angeles Station has arrived. Please take your luggage and leave the station in an orderly manner. The radio in the car started to play. Kevin suddenly opened his eyes, and a dazzling light flashed across his eyes. Finally, we've arrived. Hey, son, hurry up and run. This is a train station. There are police here to find the police. The older adult looked at Kevin anxiously. To the police? Do you think the police will protect you for the rest of your lives? Godin smiled disdainfully. He didn't think the two men would stay at the train station forever. Sir, you don't need to worry about us. We have a plan. You can leave first. Kevin smiled faintly. But, no but, sir. Let's go. Your son is still waiting for you, he said. The older adult stomped his feet, looked at Kevin helplessly, then turned around and left. Kid, do you dare to come with me? The older adult left, just like that. However, he definitely could not let them go. Kevin smiled lightly. Why would I not dare? Chelsea pouted, still pretending even at this time men are foolish creatures. I hope you can continue pretending when you see my friend in a while, Godin snorted. Episode 82, Clarkson Land. Following this, Godin walked in front, followed by Kevin and Aaron. Chelsea also followed behind them, intending to enjoy the show. The four of them walked out of the train station. From afar, Kevin saw seven to eight men standing together. When Godin walked off the train, a few guys walked over. Seeing the ferocious looks on their faces, Miss Starr subconsciously took a few steps back, maintaining a distance between her and the men. Mr. Urich, was it these two brats that offended you? The leader, a tall black man, stared fiercely at the two men. Marvin, it's these two bastards. You have to give them a good beating today. Godin stood beside his friend Marvin Dexter and looked coldly at Kevin and Aaron. Marvin looked into Kevin's tense eyes and clenched his fists tightly. He sneered and said, Kid, where did you come from? You're so arrogant, and how dare you provoke our boss? Sacramento, Kevin said calmly. So, you're a country boy from Sacramento, he nodded lightly. No wonder you're so brainless. Say it, do you want to keep a leg or an arm? He joked. Kevin smiled faintly and said, I want to keep all of them. All of them? Marvin snorted. I think that wasn't an option. Attack! Marvin waved his hand, and the men behind him came over. Aaron stepped forward expressionlessly and prepared to make his move. At this moment, the crowd in the square began to stir. Quite a few audience members took out their phones and began to take videos. Marvin and Godin were stunned. What were they filming? The few men who were ready to attack them also stopped what they were doing and looked in the direction of the commotion. Then, they were dumbfounded. It turned out to be five black Rolls Royces heading towards them in a line. The lead car was a golden B8888, and it was no wonder that the crowd was in an uproar. A luxury sports car like this one was already quite rare, not to mention five Rolls Royces. 
one of the cars had hundreds of embellishments that cost no less than 800 grand. The passerby in the square all stood on their tiptoes, staring at the five Rolls Royces. These fabulous were here to pick up the guests. Marvin wasn't in a hurry to make a move. He could always take care of Kevin. However, this kind of commotion was rarely seen in a lifetime. Chelsea frowned. Wasn't there only one Rolls Royce at home? And she thought that hers were silver. She was in the middle of her thoughts when she saw all five cars drive toward her. At this point, she did not doubt that these cars were here to pick her up. Besides her, no one else in the square had the right to be picked up in such a fashionable way. As for Godin, this kind of idiot probably couldn't even afford a single Rolls Royce. A proud smile appeared on her face as she walked toward the car like a proud peacock. It stopped in the middle of the square and several men and women in designer clothes got off. Chelsea also walked in front of them, but she was confused soon after. Why didn't she recognize any of the people who got off the car? It was as if her driver wasn't among them. Moreover, these people all had dignified appearances in sharp, expensive suits. They didn't seem like drivers at all, but more like the elites of the business world. Who were you looking for? Seeing Chelsea staring at them in a daze, a man who looked like a bodyguard asked in the alert. The people behind him were all the company's elites. They were gathered together to receive a guest this time, so naturally, nothing could happen to them. Embarrassed, she quickly shook her head. I'm not looking for anyone. Even if she didn't have eyes, she could still tell that these people were very big brother and weren't her butlers. It was evident that they were here to pick up someone else. However, who exactly were they here to pick up? With such a grand display, what was the person's identity being picked up? Her heart felt like it was being eaten by a million mosquitoes, extremely itchy. Godin naturally saw this group of people. When he saw that he knew one of the men, he couldn't help but exclaim, Cousin! Cousin, why are you here too? This time, Godin was no longer calm. He began to feel anxious about Carter Clarkston's appearance because he was in the process of promoting him. Carter is the general manager of the Clarkson Real Estate Project Department of Los Angeles' most prominent real estate company. In the company, he could be considered a core member. He could even participate in the development of every building in the community. In these past few years, Godin was attached to Carter that he had been able to become famous through the projects he had given him through the company. It could be said that Mr. Clarkson was his source of income. Without him, he was nothing. Godin was very excited to see him. Boss, is your cousin a member of Clarkson Real Estate? Marvin swallowed his saliva and asked with a face full of envy. Clarkson Real Estate was the biggest real estate company in the state. The total assets of the company were over 60 billion. It was an aircraft carrier company ranked in the top 10 of the US daily wealth list. If he could contract with this company, he would probably wake up every morning with a smile. Of course not. My cousin is the manager of the Clarkson Real Estate Project Department. In the development of the building, all of them are allowed to have my cousin's signature on it. Godin felt very proud. Carter didn't want him to announce their relationship outside. But today, Mr. Urich didn't want to keep a low profile. He wanted to let Aaron and Kevin, these two country rednecks, experience his relationship. Boss, can you give me a chance to introduce your cousin to him? Marvin gave a timid smile. If he could establish a relationship with the manager of this department, then the number of workers under his command would surely double by seven or eight times. Godin had an ugly expression on his face. Marvin was just a tiny building contractor after all. He only had a few dozen people under his command. His class was too low, so his cousin might not think much of it. But since he had already boasted, he had to bring Marvin to see Mr. Clarkson no matter what. As for whether his cousin was willing to know him, that was none of his business. Therefore, Carter agreed immediately. Okay, I'll take you to meet my cousin soon, but don't be offended if he doesn't give you a chance. It's all right, boss, as long as you're willing to bring me there, he said excitedly. Oh yeah, Boss Godin, your cousin and the others seem to be here to pick up guests. Do you know who they're here to pick up? Marvin asked. 
Looking at the positions of these people in the car, Carter was the one with the lowest position. He kept his head down and even had very few chances to raise his head so that one could imagine the other people must be the general manager of Clarkson Real Estate and members of the board of directors. To be able to make a group of directors come out to welcome him, he would probably only be a chairman. Episode 83 Each Street Lamp? The person they want to pick is the chairman of Clarkson Real Estate, Mr. Urich said confidently. The chairman of Clarkson Real Estate? Marvin's face was full of envy. I'm afraid he's one of the people on the Forbes ranking. Nonsense. With a net worth of over 60 billion, how could he not be on the Forbes ranking? Godin glanced at him in disdain and spoke. At this moment, Kevin smiled in disdain. What are you laughing at, redneck? You're already asking for a death sentence, and you still dare to laugh? Godin turned his head and stared at Kevin. He shook his head and said lightly, I'm laughing at your ignorance. Ignorance? Mr. Urich was a bit angry. How am I ignorant? Your cousin and the others will not be the chairman of Clarkson Real Estate, Kevin said calmly. Not the chairman of Clarkson Real Estate? Your fucking brain has been crushed by a wheel. With so many powerful figures appearing, if they didn't come to welcome me, you think they are coming here for you? His face was filled with disdain. Other than the chairman of the company, who else had the qualifications to send out five Rolls Royce? You're pretty smart. Kevin smiled faintly. Godin choked. This idiot. Has he gone mad? He was just saying it aloud, but this idiot took it for real. Boss, I think this little bastard has been scared silly and is already talking nonsense, Marvin mocked. With Kevin's clothes, he looked as if he had just got off a construction site. There was no way that he was prepared to see a board of directors dressed like that. Godin twitched his mouth and said, So, that's all you have. The guts. You're just following me everywhere. How did you get to be so frail? Kevin sighed. Do you not believe they came to pick me up? If they come to pick you up, I'll eat this lamp. Godin pointed at the street lamp beside them and mocked. Kevin said with a faint smile, Then I'm afraid your teeth aren't hard enough. As soon as he finished, a group of people walked over. The one in the lead was a tall and sexy lady wearing a short skirt and black stockings. Her black hair was tied up high, and she was dressed very neatly. Her entire body exuded the charm of a mature city woman. Jill Thomas! The executive director of Clarkston Real Estate? This is one of the city's top ten most beautiful women. Normally, she's always been elusive. So why did she come out today? Who exactly is the person that made her make such a grand show? I think it's the real chairman of Clarkston Real Estate. Many passerby thought the same as Godin. However, most of them didn't know who Miss Thomas was. The only thing these passerby could do was take out their cell phones, pat them crazily, and send messages to their friends. Looking at Jill's pretty face and waist, Godin couldn't help but swallow his saliva. He felt his lower abdomen getting a little hot. He would never be able to play with this kind of woman in his life, but it was still okay to have a taste in his mind. Cousin! Godin walked forward a few steps and welcomed him with a smile. Carter Clarkson was a thin, bespeckled, middle-aged man who appeared to be in his 40s. He had a domineering aura, and upon seeing Mr. Urich, he frowned and asked, What are you doing here? Cousin, it's nothing. Two idiotic men annoyed me on the train, and I was here to teach them a lesson, Godin said with a timid smile. Yes, Carter slightly nodded his head and warned, Be careful when attacking. Don't let people die. Sir, don't worry. I know what I'm doing, he hurriedly said. Oh yeah, Carter, your company is gathering so many people. Are you going to pick up the chairman? Godin asked. Mr. Clarkson shook his head and said, No, there's someone else. Someone else? Godin was stunned for a moment. Then, an unbelievable idea popped up in his mind. However, he denied it in less than half a second. That idiot, if he had that much power, 
he wouldn't have taken the train. What's wrong? Carter asked curiously, as if he noticed that his expression wasn't right. Nothing. Godin shook his head and laughed. Of the two men who harassed me on the train, one of them said that you guys came to pick him up. <laughs> Guardy, this isn't funny. After he said this, he intentionally looked at Mr. Clarkson's expression and found that he wasn't laughing. Instead, his mouth was wide open as he pointed at Kevin, surrounded by Marvin and his group, and stammered, Godin, the idiotic man you mentioned? It couldn't be him, right? Seeing that Carter's fingers were trembling, the smile on Godin's face froze. Say something! Mr. Clarkson's voice was trembling. Even though he had already guessed in his heart, he didn't want to believe what Mr. Urich had just said. He was the person that the entire company's superior had to welcome. Godin swallowed his saliva and asked, Carter, could it be that your company's people got it wrong? That blind thing is just a worker coming to Los Angeles to find work. Pa! A solid slap landed on Mr. Urich's fat face, causing the fat on his face to tremble. Godin, you idiot! I'll fucking kill you! Carter's eyes turned blood red. Damn the worker! Jill Thomas, the company's executive chairman, had already bent down in front of him. Not far away, Chelsea's small face had also turned pale. Even her grandfather knew that Jill Thomas was highly praised. He thought that she was a well-deserved queen of the business world and wanted her to follow her and learn from her as an example. But now, the girl that her grandfather saw as a future role model was under the command of a redneck that Chelsea looked down on. It was like a shock to the brain. What exactly was going on in this world? Mr. Bennett, I'm sorry for being late. She was a professional manager trained by the Bennett family company. Her status was no different from one of Mr. Bennett's butlers. She was in charge of the businesses in the LA region, and if the future successor of the Bennett family wanted to come to her city, she naturally had to act as the landlord, stepping forward to welcome him. It's fine, I just arrived too. Kevin smiled faintly and spoke. Seeing this scene, Marvin, who was just hooting, and the other big guys, all had cold sweat on their foreheads. Even their calves and stomachs were trembling. Mr. Bennett, these people... Jill's beautiful eyes shifted to Marvin and the other men. She was very smart to be able to control the whole Clarkson real estate. So it was obvious that Marvin's group had come to cause trouble for Kevin. Episode 84, Rest in Peace Before Kevin could say anything, Marvin had already knelt on the ground and started crying. Sir, have mercy. I have an 80-year-old mother and 3-year-old child. Oh, it's all my fault. Kevin rubbed his forehead. He didn't even say anything. How did Marvin become like this? Let's go. Let's go. I don't plan on finding trouble with you either. Kevin waved his hand and spoke. Indeed, he didn't plan to cause trouble for Marvin. This didn't match his identity. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. He left in a hurry and cursed at Godin a hundred times in his head. Godin, who was on the side, had a pale face and even his calves were trembling. Carter's expression did not look any better. If Kevin was the chairman of Clarkston Real Estate, then he might let him off on account of his contributions to the company that he had not made in so many years. But the problem was, Kevin was not the chairman of Clarkston Real Estate. His position was even higher than that. He didn't need any reason to deal with him. Mr. Urich, look at this street light. Kevin ignored Carter and instead looked at Godin with a faint smile. He wanted to cry. Even if he was beaten to death, he would never have thought that he would meet such a bone-chilling person like Kevin on the train. The company that seemed out of his reach in his eyes was underneath Kevin's pay grade. He even boasted about getting a job for Mr. Bennett. Please, Mr. Bennett, spare me. Godin also kneeled on the ground. I was an idiot to look down on someone I had just met. Sir, you have a lot of people under your command, so please, spare me. As Godin said this, he began to slap himself. He did slap himself hard. He was merciless, and his voice was very loud. Mr. Bennett, I was also wrong. I should not have let my cousin go so easily, to the point where he even dared to provoke you. 
Sir, please. Mr. Bennett, I deserve to suffer the consequences. Mr. Clarkson said in a deep voice. At this time, he naturally couldn't be alone and stay out of this mess. Only by voluntarily admitting his mistakes could he have a chance of survival. Miss Thomas ignored Carter and shifted her gaze to Kevin. Only he could make the decision. Forget it. Get lost, Kevin said indifferently. He was too lazy to bother with Godin anymore. He believed that after this incident, he wouldn't dare to be so arrogant anymore. This sort of villain would find it hard to live for long. It wouldn't be too long until he would find himself in a sticky situation. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Godin shed tears of gratitude. He thought that Kevin would at least cut off one of his fingers as a punishment today, but he didn't expect him to be so magnanimous. Actually, what Godin didn't know was that it wasn't that Kevin was magnanimous, but rather, he felt that it was beneath his status to care about a man as worthless as him. Mr. Clarkson, after you go back, report to the logistics department. Jill glanced at Carter indifferently and spoke. Kevin could let Clarkson go, but she had to show her dislike of the man. Logistics department? What was the difference between this and chasing him out of the company entirely? Carter's face was ashen, but he still said, Thank you, Chairman Thomas. Mr. Bennett, let's get in the car. I've already ordered people to clean the villa in the city. Miss Thomas laughed. No need. Just find a random hotel nearby and send us there. Kevin shook his head. He still had to think of a way to save Jared, so he couldn't be too high profile. It would not be good if the Kale family sensed something. Yes, Mr. Bennett. Although she was puzzled, Jill didn't dare to ask. Then, Kevin and Aaron got into the Rolls Royce with the extreme price tag. Chelsea Starr, who was in the distance, let out a sigh of relief after watching the corporate team leave. She was scared that Kevin was not a petty person who would cause trouble for her. But luckily, she thought too much. Kevin didn't even look at her from the beginning to the end. At this moment, Chelsea recalled how Kevin had ignored her on the train and felt extremely embarrassed. He didn't try to capture her at all. It was all her narcissism. Ten minutes after the Rolls Royce left, another Porsche arrived in the square. Seeing the Porsche, Chelsea's pretty face regained its color. Honey, are you okay? A young woman, dressed as a noblewoman, got out of the car and hurriedly walked in front of her. She shook her head. Mom, I'm fine. Darling, didn't you say you met some very disgusting people on the train? What did they do to you? Tell me, so I can take care of them, the mother asked with concern. Chelsea blushed. Mom, no, I misunderstood them. Really? The young woman glanced at her suspiciously. She hurriedly shook her head. I didn't. Mom, do you know who stood behind Jill Thomas? She asked. She wanted to know what exactly Mr. Bennett's position was. Jill Thomas? The young woman's expression changed as she hurriedly asked, Honey, why are you asking this woman? You haven't gotten into an argument with her, right? Chelsea smiled bitterly. No, I just saw her bringing a bunch of people to pick people up at this place. I don't know her story very well, but I've heard your grandfather mention her before. Her family tree is very scary. The family that she works for is one of the five richest families in the state. They own practically three whole cities. At the same time, she was also very skeptical of all this. Could it be that someone from the family that Miss Thomas works for is visiting Los Angeles? How could they be so powerful? She was frightened. She tried her best to overestimate Kevin's identity, but she didn't expect to underestimate him to this extent. In the whole country, they could be ranked as one of the top five richest families. That meant her own family was not even worth mentioning after this family. Honey, don't think too much into it. If nothing goes wrong, our family will never get involved with those kinds of families. Hurry up and go back with Mom. Mr. Kale is still waiting for you at home, the young woman quickly said. John Kale? With a bitter expression, Chelsea said, Mom, I don't want to see him. John was arranged to be her marriage partner by her family, but she didn't have a good impression of him. Mr. Kale was famous for being a playboy in college, and he got dozens of girls pregnant because of his recklessness. She hated those kinds of people the most. Darling, you are simply speaking nonsense. Your dad finally introduced you to a respectful young gentleman. 
and might I add, it was with great difficulty. If you don't go see him now, isn't it obvious that you will embarrass your dad? Furthermore, it's hard to explain to Mr. Kale why you just wouldn't show up. The Starr family was only a small, third-class family in L.A., but the Kale family was different. Even in the second-class family, the Kale family was the strongest, and it could be said that right now, their family needed the financial support that the Kale could provide. But John Kale, he... Chelsea pouted and wanted to say that he just wanted her for her body. Episode 85, Kale Company. But the young woman interrupted her. Honey, I know what you want to say, but really, what man isn't super horny? When your dad was young, he was like Mr. Kale, always flirting with whoever he met. However, he became more respectful once he got married, and I know that John will do the same. After you get married, you need to take care of him. Fine. Chelsea had a helpless expression on her face. Born in such a big family, she had no way to decide on her marriage. Jill sent Kevin to a five-star hotel. He did not stay for long either. After a simple wash-up, he directly got Aaron and called a taxi to the Kale family's villa. Their family's house was built by a lake, and the taxi brought them right to their front door, where they could still see the scenic view. They got out of the car, and a few security guards immediately came over to stop them. This is private property. You two are not allowed to enter. The leader of the security guards coldly stared at Kevin as he spoke. From the way the two men were dressed, they didn't look like the guests of the Kale family. I'm just looking for John Kale. Kevin frowned as he spoke. The head security guard looked suspiciously at him and said, You know Mr. Kale? Personally? I do. Kevin smiled. Then give him a call. If he agrees, then I'll let you in, the guard said suspiciously. Kevin sighed. I don't have his number. The security guard snorted and said, Without his phone number, you won't be able to enter this door. And if I do? Kevin's expression was calm. The guard's expression changed. You can try. Aaron's figure flashed just as he finished his sentence, and he attacked brazenly. The guard felt his vision go black as he was sent flying by what seemed like an iron fist. An alarm sounded. More than a dozen security guards came from all directions with electric batons. Kevin stood to the side with his hands behind his back. He didn't even need to do anything about this small fry. Aaron was like a tiger in a flock of sheep. He punched them, one by one. More than a dozen trained bodyguards were lying on the ground in less than a minute. The commotion over here naturally attracted the people's attention in the villa. Soon, a middle-aged man in casual clothes rushed over. Seeing dozens of his bodyguards moaning on the ground while Kevin stood on the side with a calm and composed demeanor, the middle-aged man's expression immediately turned extremely gloomy. Friend, do you have a problem to sort out with the Kale family? The middle-aged man asked coldly. His name was Stefani Walters, the main butler of the Kale family. Kevin smiled and did not answer. Instead, he asked, Where is John Kale? You're from Sacramento? Stefani immediately reacted when he heard that Kevin had come to look for John. I'll ask again. Where is Mr. Kale? Kevin's tone was filled with impatience. Mr. Kale went out. He's not home. Stefani suppressed the anger in his chest. Aaron... Search inside. Kevin frowned. He didn't completely believe the words of this middle-aged man, so it was better to search for them. You're not allowed to enter. Seeing that Kevin and Aaron wanted to enter Kale's home, Stefani immediately became anxious. If two men went in, there is no way to tell what would happen. Kevin smiled disdainfully and said, If you say you can't enter, I won't go in. If you dare to enter, the, the Kale family will not let you off. He threatened with a fierce expression, yet his voice faltered. However, Kevin completely ignored him and was about to step into the Kale family gate with his hands behind his back. Helpless, Stefani could only personally come to stop him. Then, he was kicked away by Aaron with a light kick. Don't go in, 
I'll tell you where your boss is. If he let the two men enter the house, he, the butler, would surely be fired immediately. Where? Kevin said lightly. Mr. Kale is at the Star's house right now. He's going on a date with Miss Chelsea. He could only send the two men to John's side. Mr. Kale had been bringing a bodyguard around with him for the past two days, hoping that he would be protected if Kevin found him. The Star's house. Aaron, let's go to that house, Kevin muttered. He didn't feel like Stefani was lying at all. As soon as Kevin left, Mr. Walters took out his phone and dialed Mr. Kale's number. Sir, it's bad. Someone from Sacramento has arrived. At this moment, Mr. Kale was sitting in the living room of the Star's house. He was having a nice chat with all of Chelsea's family members. Hearing Stefani's flustered voice on the phone, John said with dissatisfaction, They're here? What are you panicking for? Sir, that group of people almost broke into your house. The butler wanted to cry, but no tears came out. What? Mr. Kale's expression changed. He was familiar with the security forces in the house, but someone almost broke into the house. How many people are there? Two, Stefani said weakly. Two? Just two people almost intruded into the house? Are you all a bunch of idiots? John cursed. Where are they now? Sir, they're going to look for you now. Good. Very good. They dare to come find me. John gritted his teeth and sneered. Two rednecks. They treated a large city like Los Angeles as they would a little place like Sacramento. They even dared to track him down. Sir, what do we do now? Should I call the police? Mr. Walters probed. Do you still think my family has not been shamed enough today? John scolded. If they let others know that their family was forced to call the police by two rednecks, then the family would completely lose all respect. Don't worry. Since they dared to come, I will not let them down easily. I will tell them what they mean by teaching someone a serious lesson. John said sinisterly. He was not without any backing. After bringing Mr. Kale back from Sacramento, he had made preparations to have someone come from the city center to visit him. So he spent a large amount of money to hire a bodyguard from the best fighting club in the entire state. This bodyguard was not like the other poor quality and undertrained bodyguards, but rather, he was a reigning champion in the fighting ring. He started practicing fighting at the age of seven, And this year, he has become a robust young, all-around best champion at the age of 37. It could be imagined how terrifying his strength would be. Fighting one against a hundred people was not a problem. John had personally seen this punch pierce through the steel plate as thick as his palm. Such a fist was not something the mortal body could block. Mr. Kale hung up the phone and his smile returned. Mr. Kale... What's the trouble? Miss Starr's mother asked with a smile. The relationship between Mr. Kale and her daughter Chelsea could be settled, so it would not be an exaggeration to say that he was her future son-in-law. John smiled and said, Really, Stefani, it's nothing. I just met two ignorant fools who are asking for a beating. Do you need my help? If you do, then tell me. I still have a few people that I can use. He was very clear on the strength that the Kale possessed. In front of just one of the superiors in their company, ordinary people would not even be able to look them in the eye. Yet here, these men are trying to fool themselves by trying to disrespect them? Episode 86, Country Rednecks. John shook his head and said, No need, Lily. Two little rednecks came over from Sacramento I think I can handle them. Hmm, that's good. Chelsea's mother, Lily Starr, nodded slightly. From Sacramento? On the other hand, after Chelsea heard this, her expression couldn't help but turn strange. The youth that Jill Thomas welcomed just now seemed to have come from Sacramento as well. It couldn't be such a coincidence, right? It shouldn't be. She quietly comforted herself in her thoughts. However... She didn't know why, but she had a faint sense of anticipation. If the two rednecks that John mentioned were the two people she saw on the train... Mr. Kale, after you're done with what you're doing, 
take Miss Star out to play. You youngsters also have something in common, Lily laughed. Let's see if she's even willing to go with me. John looked overjoyed as he looked at Chelsea. He was quite satisfied with her. She was the campus heartthrob when she was in college. Not only was she pretty, but her family history was also good. She came from a lot of money. John thought that she seemed worthy. Chelsea forced a smile and was about to say yes. At this moment, an anxious voice sounded out. Miss Lily, someone outside is looking for Mr. Kale. Oh! Lily looked at him, smiled, and asked, John, you said that the two men who came from Sacramento are here. Do you want a guard to help you chase them out? No need, ma'am. Let them in. I was just worried that I wouldn't be able to find them. He smiled faintly as a trace of ruthlessness flashed across his face. Let them in. Lily waved her hand and instructed. Following this, Aaron and Kevin strolled in. The moment she saw them, Chelsea's pupils constricted and her breathing quickened. It was those two on the train. Lily looked at them as if they were already dead. Then she retracted her gaze and began to taste her tea. In her opinion, offending Mr. Kale was already enough to sentence the two of them to death. John suddenly stood up, coldly looked at the two men, and asked, You two reckless fools, are you here to save that old bitch, Jared? What did you do to Mr. Smith? Aaron stepped forward and asked in a stern voice, Mr. Smith! <laughs> John laughed out loud and quickly retracted his smile. That old thing. I've already chopped him into pieces and fed him to the dogs. Hearing this, veins on Aaron's forehead instantly popped out. He was unable to contain his anger. You are simply asking to die. As soon as he finished, Aaron stepped in front of John and threw an iron fist like a cannonball toward his face. The blade-like fist wind caused his face to hurt, but he didn't even blink. In the next moment, a tower-like figure appeared in front of him. A big hand reached out and easily blocked Aaron's angry blast punch. Kevin's gaze turned serious, and for the first time, a hint of surprise appeared on his face. This tower-like man seemed to be a fighting leader. Aaron's pupils also shrank. He felt that his punch had hit steel. The man who looked like an iron tower sneered. He turned his palm into a fist and punched toward his temple. This punch was going to be solid. The head would probably explode. However, Aaron is also a ruthless person who has been walking on the edge of life and death for many years. When his adrenaline kicks in, his reaction is extremely fast. With a twist of his body, he narrowly avoided the punch. Seeing that the punch that he was so confident in did not kill him, the little snake, Frank Cena's expression immediately turned ugly. He roared angrily and directly sent a vicious knee strike towards Aaron's lower abdomen. Stop! At this moment, a clear and melodious voice came out of nowhere. Everyone turned around to see Chelsea Star. John looked at her in surprise. He didn't understand why she wanted to tell him to stop. She wanted to save Aaron? Chelsea, what are you shouting for? Lily sternly shouted. Chelsea glanced at Kevin without leaving a trace and said, Mom, these two are my friends. Nonsense! What kind of friend is this? How come I've never heard that you have such a friend before? She said somewhat angrily. John's face also turned ugly. Chelsea was his wife, but now she was speaking up for another man. Mother, these are my friends. Can you just let them go? Chelsea begged. She was not able to say what she was suffering for now. Not because she wanted to save the two men she had met on the train. She would never be able to live with herself if they died. Mr. Bennett's backers would not let them off and treat her family as accomplices. Mr. Kale did not know Mr. Bennett's true identity. He was someone that even Jill Thomas had to treat with respect. She wanted John to die, but she did not want him to ruin the legacy that the stars were able to build. Chelsea, I could promise you anything else, but not this one. Your two friends must pay the price today. Originally, he had no intention of killing the two men. But Chelsea's actions had lit a murderous flame in his chest. Mr. Kale, 
Chelsea still wanted to plead for mercy, but Lily had already opened her mouth coldly. Shut up. If you dare to say another word, then scram. Although she felt wronged, she didn't dare to say more. Now she could only pray to herself that Kevin would let her family off after she begged for mercy for him. Kevin smiled. This girl wasn't as stupid as he thought. Butch, do it. Jaw didn't think too much and instructed the tower-like man to take action. Butch Williams, who was almost six and a half feet tall, sneered and stomped on the ground. He charged toward Aaron, using the momentum he gathered from the impact. The impact from his huge skeleton in the solid tendon was no less than that from a raging bull. If Aaron were to be hit by him directly, he would probably fall apart. His expression changed. In terms of strength, he was indeed no match for this man. But he couldn't dodge at this moment either. Once he dodged, he would fall into Butch's rhythm of attack. If he did, he would lose. Just when Aaron was in a dilemma, a lazy voice sounded from behind him. His legs! Kevin only said two words, but Aaron's eyes lit up fiercely. His legs! Butch's weakness was his lower body! Kevin saw it. He didn't have enough time to think how Kevin had figured it out, so he hastily attacked, focusing on the huge man's weakness. Now that Butch's weakness had been discovered, his moves began to be timid and no longer open and close like before. His strength was not much higher than Aaron's. It was only because of his inborn strength that he was able to suppress him. But after he attacked his weakness, his advantage was gone. He had to be on guard against Aaron's attack at all times, and he failed to cover his weak spots. Episode 87, The Willingham Manor Under this direction, Aaron gradually gained the upper hand. Bang! He kicked Butch's calf bone in half, breaking it with the sheer force behind his kick. He fell to the ground with a howl of pain, his face turning the color of a pig's liver. Defeat. John's eyes were wide open with disbelief, written all over his face. Butch was the best he knew, and he was a well-decorated one at that. He had been rumored to have been awarded the highest medal of honor in the fighting ring. How could he lose to a redneck from the small town of Sacramento? His legs! John suddenly remembered that this fight started after that lazy young man said the word leg. At that time, he did not understand what the next move meant. But now, he had realized it. He was telling the boy where Butch's weak spots were. He was cheating! Mr. Kale stared at Kevin. The heaviness in his eyes was obvious. Could it be that this young man was the main culprit? Who are you? John asked in fear. Kevin Bennett, he said lightly. Was it Jared that sent you? John asked. It was obvious that he was not one of Jared's silly workers. His position was higher than Mr. Smith's. Kevin chuckled and said, Friend, you want to stand up for him? Do you know that that is disrespecting my family, correct? Mr. Kale asked. For people like Kevin, who couldn't see the real situation clearly, he had to interview them before they told him what he cared about. Kevin laughed disdainfully and said, So the Kale family, is it that amazing? John's face flushed red. This was the first time someone had ridiculed his family in front of him. Where did you jump out from? After a long while, John finally managed to say something like this. There were hundreds of wealthy class families in L.A., but none of them were of the wealthy class with the last name Bennett. You don't deserve to know, Kevin said indifferently. After he finished speaking, he glanced at John and said, I know Jared is still alive. If you're smart, take me to him. What if I don't? He didn't believe that this man could do anything to him in front of so many people. You won't do what I say? Kevin smiled. Then... His face turned cold. Then I'll beat you up today. Mr. Kale's expression changed. Indeed, although Mr. Bennett might not be able to kill him here, he could still beat him up. If he was beaten up by another man in front of Chelsea, then he wouldn't be able to show his face around her ever again. In the end, John still clenched his teeth and said, That old bitch Jared indeed did not die, but he is currently in Willingham Manor, do you dare to go? 
What is there to be afraid of? Just lead the way. Although he did not know where this Willingham Manor was, he was not afraid that John would dare to play any tricks. In Los Angeles, the only people that could pose a threat to him were those old, horrible men. Hmm. You sure have guts, John sneered. That idiot Kevin. How did he not even know where Willingham Manor was and still dared to follow him? In that case, come with me. This house was his base camp. Once there, even if this man had wings, he wouldn't be able to fly out. All right. Kevin's answer was as concise as usual. Mr. Kale, take Chelsea with you. If anything happens on the way, she can run errands for you. Kevin did not know what kind of place this manor was. He knew that if she could take this opportunity to build a relationship with a person from that area, it would bring about an unimaginable benefit to her family. Miss Starr, what do you think? John smiled at her. I have no objections. She wanted to say that she had an objection, but Lily, who was in a rush to expand the family, simply wouldn't give her the chance to do so. Then come with me. I'll take care of you. He smiled faintly. At the same time, he could use this opportunity to make her understand how laughable her two so-called friends, Kevin and Aaron, were in front of real businessmen. Then, the driver of the Kales drove the four of them to the Willingham Manor. At first, Kevin didn't know what kind of place it was. It wasn't until the driver drove the car deep into the mountains that Kevin found out that the Willingham Manor was just a humble vacation home. It was similar to a farmhouse in the countryside. It was nice, for lower standards. Not only were there orchards and vegetable gardens, but there were also hunting grounds on top of hunting grounds. As for the entertainment facilities, such as the full-service bar and indoor movie theater, they were also well-equipped. Orchards and gardens were naturally a form of farming activity that provided free time to the white-collar workers of ordinary cities. On the other hand, shooting ranges and hunting grounds were only open to senior members. If you were a member of a guild, even protected animals like black bears and wolves could become your prey on the hunting grounds. Of course, whether or not you could hunt bears and tigers depends on your ability. The closer they got to the house, the more confident John looked. The interior of the manor was very spacious. Even though it was a weekday, there were still many tourists on the grounds. Private cars were not allowed to enter the manor, but when the security guard at the entrance saw John sitting in the car, he immediately let him in. He had a very high status here. Chelsea, what do you think of this place? He asked proudly. Not bad. The manor was very famous in the city. It was a place that the local people of Los Angeles dreamed of the most. However, the cost was high and there was a need to get a card. Even the basic membership with no special amenities is almost $50,000. The gold card also requires $500,000. As for the higher grade platinum cards, they were worth a million. Moreover, he couldn't use the money from the card to spend. If he wanted to spend it, he would need to charge extra. The only function of a membership card is to determine the level of certain items you can play. For example, in a shooting range during a hunting event, only the owner of a platinum card could enter. Chelsea also had a membership card here, but it was the lowest grade silver card. I'll get someone to give you a platinum membership card later. In the future, you can bring your classmates and friends here to play. He had a 10% share of the business. Even if he were to give a million platinum membership cards away, to him, it was not a big deal. As long as he could get Chelsea's attention, he could care less about anything else. Episode 88, Underground Boxing Ring Mr. Kale, that's not good, right? Chelsea had a troubled expression on her face. If it was a normal person, she would have accepted the card. With the unlimited white gold card, all of her best friends would have envied her to death. But at this critical moment, with Kevin by her side, it would not be good if he mistakenly thought that she and Mr. Kale had some sort of secret relationship there's nothing bad about it. We'll be family in the future. This platinum membership card is my gift to you. If you like it here, I can even give you the diamond membership card. 
John said in a rich tone. A diamond membership card here is $10 million, and it's not something you can make just because you have money. You even need power and influence, enough to attract the attention of several shareholders to the company. All right, then, she forced a smile and said. Mr. Kale intentionally said this in front of Aaron and Kevin. Giving her a membership card was one thing, but more importantly, he wanted to suppress the two men's arrogance. However, John didn't know that Kevin, who had his back against the wealthy class of the United States, was now treating him like a puppet. Chelsea, the orchard, the acres of hunting ground you're looking at, is just an outer garden of the international Willingham Manor. After driving for a few minutes, John's smile became more mysterious. Outer garden? She was slightly shocked. This was already a few dozen miles, and it was still just an extra garden? How could this place be so great? And according to what John had said previously, the main building had an indoor basketball court, which she had never heard of before. Yes, the outer garden, John laughed complacently. Actually, Willingham Manor has many other amenities, such as housing lots of business. The inner court is the core business of the manor, but the vast majority of people do not know about it. The inner court? Only the upper class of Los Angeles can come in contact with it. John's tone was filled with a sense of pride. He glanced at the two men behind him and mocked, You two rednecks, your luck is pretty good. That old bitch Jared was locked in the inner court by me. When you go see him in a little bit, you can open your dog's eyes wide and take a good look at the scenery of the inner garden. This might be the last scene you'll see in your whole life. Kevin smiled disdainfully. He finally understood where his confidence lay. As expected, this manor was created by a group of rich kids. Those rich kids must have this kind of power behind them. These powers were all things that Mr. Kale relied on. After another two minutes, the car finally stopped. Kevin's gaze turned serious. In front of him was a European-style ancient castle. In front of the castle stood many black suit security personnel wearing headphones. This batch of security personnel was much more professional than the security personnel that surrounded the perimeter. Their eyes were sharp like a falcon's. Kevin even noticed that many of them had been in the army before this because they all wore American flag pins. The aura of mercenaries exuded from them was very obvious. It was hard to imagine that there would be such a heavily guarded castle in this deep mountain. Kevin immediately retracted his contempt. The master of this ancient castle was very ambitious and not simple. He was different from a fool like John Cale. John was the first to get out of the car, followed by Kevin and Aaron. Arriving at the entrance of the ancient castle, a security guard, who seemed to be the leader, smiled and came forward. Mr. John Cale, the boss is already waiting inside. He nodded slightly and said, I'll bring them in now. He glanced at Kevin and said provocatively, Cowboy, it's too late to regret now. It'll be difficult for you to come out again if you enter this place. Kevin smiled and didn't reply. He directly walked through the entrance of the ancient castle. John sneered. Wait until we enter. I'll make you regret it. After entering the ancient castle, Kevin just realized that there was no one in the building. At this moment, John took out a card and swiped it to open a black door. Inside the door, there was an elevator leading below the ground. So, it's underground. Kevin finally understood. The four of them entered the elevator. John pressed the button for basement level five, and the elevator began to descend. A few seconds later, they arrived. The moment the door opened, there was deafening music and a series of screams. Kevin frowned and looked over. Only then did he realize that what appeared in the dim and blurred light was a bar. One after another, crazy men and women were shaking their heads in the ballroom. On the table were all kinds of expensive foreign wine and a lot of prohibited pills. Seated in the seating area were many reputable, successful merchants from the outside world and new and upstarts from the political world. However, at this moment, these elites didn't show any of their elegance in the outside world. They all revealed their ugly expressions and hugged each other. Kevin even saw a famous second-tier jade lady in Los Angeles. The female star was usually a pure female star. 
but this pure female jade star was blushing here. She hugged a male model as if no one else was around and kissed him. The male model's large hands were caressing the female star's body. John was not surprised by this. He was already used to it. Only Chelsea's beautiful face was filled with disbelief, as she couldn't believe that there was such a dark place within the Willingham Manor. They walked another hundred meters, then left the bar and entered a boxing ring. There was only one stage in the arena, but quite a few spectators in the surroundings. At this moment, two vigorous figures were fighting in the ring, but what surprised them was that the two fighters were not wearing any protective gear. They were fighting with their lives on the line. The moves that the two of them used were not free fighting moves, but the famous killing techniques passed down in the military. One move kill. One of them had been beaten into a bloody mess in just a short while. He wouldn't be able to survive. Bam! He lashed out with his leg again, causing his bloodied body to fly out and land on the ground outside the arena. Many people stood up in excitement in the audience stands, their faces red with excitement. There were also quite a few people whose expressions were gloomy as they cursed the unlucky. He even said that this piece of trash is the provincial champion. He can't even hold on for ten minutes. What a fucking garbage. I bet five million on him. All of it went down the drain this time. Kevin wasn't surprised. These people were gamblers, but they were gambling with someone else's life. This kind of life and death arena was very common in foreign countries. It was naturally forbidden at home, but people who had ulterior motives could secretly open it. This boxing ring was a secret boxing ring. Judging from the gambling stakes, the gambling stake was not small. It had almost reached a hundred million. Such a large amount was rarely seen in foreign countries. Kevin was suddenly curious. Who exactly was the boss of Willingham International? In such a dark and gloomy place, the guests who came here weren't worried about their privacy being leaked. It was obvious that they were very confident in the boss's power. Episode 89, The Greatest Reliance. At this time, a short-haired youth wearing camouflage clothes walked over. He was about six feet tall and had a well-proportioned body. He had a well-defined face. Seeing the short-haired young man, John's expression immediately became respectful. Mr. Crow, I've brought him here. The short-haired teenager nodded. He glanced at Chelsea and his gaze paused on her pretty face for a moment, then looked at Aaron and Kevin, and asked carelessly, You are from Sacramento? Kevin nodded. The short-haired youth nodded slightly. Not bad. You have quite the gut. Where's Mr. Smith? Aaron asked in a deep voice. Mr. Smith? Come with me. The short-haired teenager smiled playfully as he walked in front. Aaron followed closely while Kevin frowned as he glanced at the few hidden corners of their surroundings. He thought to himself, This is going to be troublesome. After walking for a few more meters, Kevin saw a few reconstructed prisons. Jared was impressively locked in one of them. However, his appearance was rather miserable. His entire body was covered with bone-deep wounds and he had turned into a man made of blood. Some of his wounds even revealed the cartilage of his joints. It was obvious that he had received inhuman torture. Seeing Mr. Smith lying on the ground on the verge of death, Aaron's eyes suddenly opened wide. He turned around and prepared to attack the short-haired young man. However, the young man seemed to have expected this and pulled out a gun from his waist and pointed it at his forehead. You can try. Let's see if you'll hit me faster or if I'll shoot you faster. Ronald Crow looked coldly at him and said. He stared at Ronald. Veins were popping up on his forehead, but he didn't dare to attack again. The calluses on his palms showed that he was an expert at using pistols. Such an expert could have shot him before he could do anything. Chelsea was also frightened to the point that her face turned pale. She didn't expect to run into a gun here. It would only appear in TV shows, John smiled complacently and immediately kicked 
Aaron's waist, scolding. Aren't you so fucking good at fighting? Continue. And you, Redneck, aren't you awesome? Why aren't you saying anything now? Mr. Kale looked at him arrogantly. He was sure that Kevin would never think there would be a gun in the Willingham Manor. Because right now, the country's control over guns is extremely strict. Many people are in the gray zone. As long as they dared to touch the guns, they would get arrested if they did not have a license. Overall, guns were truly rare items. In places like Sacramento, other than the officials, it was even harder for you to find a gun in anyone's home, much less someone in public. Any random gun could be sold for over $100,000 on the black market. He spent a lot of effort to buy the pistol in his hand, which cost him around $500,000 on the black market. Is this what you rely on the most? Kevin sighed and asked in disappointment. Indeed, he was disappointed. He had thought that John would come up with something unique to deal with him, but he didn't expect that he would only have a gun. What do you mean? John was stunned. No! Are you fucking blind? Look carefully. What is Mr. Ronald holding in his hand? Kevin smiled. Mm, Desert Eagle, 357 inches in diameter, firing speed of 378 meters per second, and bomb capacity of eight. It was produced in 1985. Am I right? He glanced at Ronald and asked calmly. You've dabbled with guns before. He suddenly realized that something was off about Kevin. Ever since he entered the door, he had been very calm. Even now, when he took out his gun, the expression on his face did not change. What kind of confidence did he have? He shook his head. He understood almost all firearms, but he had never touched any because his mentor wouldn't let him. Travis Graham once said that if he touched a gun, he would have distracting thoughts on the cultivation of fighting. He would always think of a shortcut, and it was difficult for his self-defense skills to grow so he had never touched a gun. Although Kevin shook his head, Mr. Crow felt even more uneasy. He was once the ace soldier of an entire Navy fleet. He knew very well that firearms were not invincible in this world. In front of some people, firearms were just a toy. However, such a person was extremely rare. Normally, ordinary people would never see such a person. Could it be that this young man in front of him was such a person? Ronald's expression was unsettled. He looked at Kevin and asked, Now, are you a trained fighter? Kevin smiled faintly and did not reply. With Mr. Crow's social status, he could already come into contact with the highest levels of fighters. Kevin's attitude made him more uneasy. If he were the best fighter, he would have to consider whether it was worth it to offend him over someone as measly as Jared Smith. Behind the world's best fighter, there was usually a load of sponsors. All of these sponsors were distinguished guests of the upper class. Even if he could kill Kevin here, there would be a lot of trouble in the future. If you are the world's best fighter, today's matter is a misunderstanding. You can bring this person back. Ronald still didn't dare to take a gamble. Although he might be pretending to be calm, if Ronald were to get into a fight with the world's best fighter, he would surely lose. After beating him to death, the sponsors that backed him would come and surely kill him. If he couldn't beat Kevin to death, Ronald was even more scared to think about it. Most of the people who had just become the world's best fighters could be killed with a single bullet, but there were a few other ones that he could not subdue with a gun, so they could now be called practically immortal. Even if it was the person behind him, the Earth Immortal, he could not afford to offend them. Mr. Crow! John was completely confused. He did not understand why John would be so afraid of him after only saying a few words from the beginning. Even if Kevin were the world's greatest fighter, he would not be like this. Shut up! Ronald glared coldly at John. This idiot, Mr. Kale, did not understand that there was not much of a problem if Kevin held the title. But the problem was that he was too young. To become one of the world's greatest fighters at this age, not only because his talent was outstanding, but also because he had sponsors backing him, was not simple. Butch Williams was also one reigning champion, but it took him 30 years to earn the title. Mr. Crow did not pay much attention to a young man like him because his talent was limited, and in the future, he was destined not to have any high achievements. The teacher behind him, namely Gorilla's Fight Club, was not even the top fighting arts school in the city. 
and the person behind Ronald could easily deal with him. However, Ronald, the man in front of him, had no idea what was going on with him. If he had a title such as the world's greatest fighter, he could be a danger to the Willingham Manor. Just a misunderstanding? Kevin glanced at him coldly. It seemed that he still had not realized what kind of person Ronald was to him. Episode 90, The Hidden Mastermind What do you mean? Seeing that Kevin did not intend to let this matter go so easily, Ronald's expression also turned cold. He was afraid of the man, but he wasn't scared to the point that he had to submit to him. There's no meaning. After you beat up my people, you must be prepared to pay the price. Kevin spoke indifferently. After which, he glanced at John and Mr. Crow and said, The two of you will break one of your arms. This matter can be resolved. Arrogant. Ronald's face turned ashen. Other than being arrogant, he didn't know what else to say. The person in front of him was being held at gunpoint, and he dared to make him cut off his hand? He was too idiotic. Idiot? Did you not fucking wake up from your dream? Open your bitch eyes wide and look. Ronald has a gun in his hand. He can send you to the heavens as long as he moves his fingers. Do you fucking think you're invincible? You still dare to let me cut off your hand? Today, I will get my revenge. After John said this, he picked up the machete beside him and slashed at Kevin with a ferocious expression. How reckless. He snorted coldly and slapped John's face. A loud sound echoed out. Mr. Kale was directly sent flying and crashed into the iron bars of the prison. Before he landed on the ground, seven to eight bloody teeth flew out of his mouth. What are you doing? Ronald was immediately angered. He was still holding a gun in his hand, but this man dared to attack his partner? He did not respect him in the slightest bit. Ronald aimed his gun at Kevin in an instant. He narrowed his eyes. You dare to shoot? You are asking me to kill you? Why would I not dare to shoot? Ron clenched his teeth and pulled the trigger. A gunshot rang out. A flame shot out from the black muzzle toward the middle of Kevin's eyebrows. Aaron's eyes almost burst out of their sockets. Chelsea screamed and closed her eyes. Only Kevin was calm and composed. There was even a faint smile on his face. The air smelled of gunpowder. The black bullets pierced through the air and arrived three feet in front of Kevin. In the next second, he stretched out two fingers. The incoming bullets were gently caught. Ronald suddenly opened his eyes wide and was overwhelmed with shock. Even his mind was a little unsteady from the impact. How is this possible? The world's greatest fighter. The ultimate world's greatest fighter. None of the spectators could believe their eyes. Ronald was cursing in his head. Didn't the rumors say that this kind of fighter would never enter society? Why? Why? Why did he meet such a man? In the past, he had only heard people say that some of the world's best fighters could receive bullets with their bare hands and could even take on rocket launchers with their bare hands. He was still skeptical about this matter and felt that human strength could not reach that level. How could he still be considered a human if he could even take a rocket launcher head on? But today, Mr. Bennett used his actions to tell him that the human potential was limitless. Nothing is impossible. At this moment, Aaron's shock was not much less than Ronald's. He had tried his best to overestimate his strength, but he didn't expect it to be this terrifying. Previously, he thought Kevin was only a beginner in fighting. But now, it seems that he has become a master of fighting to the point where he has gathered a group of sponsors. Kevin sighed and asked, Do you still want to shoot? Mr. Crow kneeled on the ground and his mouth started to quiver. Sir, have mercy. Ronald was scared. He was really scared. He never thought that this would happen. Could he have mercy? Chelsea, who had her eyes closed, opened her eyes when she heard this. She realized that Ronald was kneeling on the ground while Kevin was standing with his hands behind his back. What was going on? Why isn't he dead? 
Chelsea was extremely shocked. She thought he would die when Mr. Crow opened fire. But now, he was standing perfectly still. Instead, it was Ronald who kneeled. What had happened? Her heart was beating rapidly. She felt that in those few seconds when she closed her eyes, something big must have happened. But she missed it. Kevin shook his head and said, Aaron, let's do it. Yes, Mr. Bennett. Aaron looked excited. Originally, he didn't have any hope of saving Jared, but he never expected such a sudden turn of events to happen. Kevin's position in his heart was no different from a god at this moment. Sir, please, spare my life. Ronald panicked when he saw Aaron walk toward him with a cold expression. Sir, my big brother is the mastermind. Please, for the sake of my big brother, give me a hand. Aaron looked at Kevin. This young businessman was the mastermind behind Willingham International. He didn't know what kind of background he had for the time being. If he was a big shot, he might bring trouble to Kevin. Kevin, he is the heir to their family. Those on the streets all call him Prince Ronald, Chelsea reminded him anxiously. Los Angeles had four first-line families. The Crow family was one of them. In recent years, the older adult Vector Crow of the company had retired, and now his son Michael was in charge of the company, which made them even more powerful. Otherwise, Ronald wouldn't have gotten the title of Prince. Do it. He spoke without even looking at her. Prince? Sorry, he doesn't know this guy. Yes, Mr. Bennett. Aaron nodded respectfully and then kicked his face, sending him flying. Bang! A few teeth flew out of his mouth with a crisp sound, and he spat out a mouthful of blood. The intense pain made Ronald's whole body tremble. But this was not all. Aaron sneered and kicked again, directly stepping on the back of his hand. Another crisp sound. Ronald's arm bones were crushed. Pain. A heart-wrenching pain. His eyes were bloodshot, but he did not dare make a sound. He was afraid that if he spoke again... Kevin would kill him. At this moment, John finally got up from the ground. Seeing Ronald's miserable state, he ran away. However, Aaron didn't give him a chance. He flew up and kicked him to the ground. Then he did the same. He stomped on John's hand viciously. A scream that sounded like a pig being butchered echoed through the room. John rolled his eyes and fainted from the pain. It had not even been ten seconds since Aaron and Kevin decided to make a move, and two people already had their hands broken. Chelsea only managed to react when John screamed. Even though Kevin knew the prince's name, he still decided to make a move on Ronald without hesitation.